I'd like to welcome to the stage Tim Costello, our keynote speaker. Perfect. Whoop. I got to grab that from you. All right, welcome everybody. I think I stand between you and cocktails, so that's a, that's a bad place for me to be with a bunch of builders. I know that. We're going to go on um, a different little journey. Um, John, uh, when he asked me if I would talk, you know, he says, oh my God, Tim, come talk about, you know, IoT and 5G and AR and VR and AI and data science and you know, blah, 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 uh, charge capacity of batteries, microsensors, and, and quite honestly, um, there's something way more important that we need to talk about. All of that is just a bunch of kind of mumble jumbo, you know, keywords that make it sound really interesting and, and really exciting. But if you don't have a methodology to incorporate this into you as an individual and into your company and then activate it so that you can end up building the future, then all those buzzwords are completely worthless. So we're going we're gonna to take a journey by going back in time. We're going to go back to the summer right here in Washington, D.C. in July of 1861. In July of 1861, uh, it had already become hot and sultry, kind of had come into the doldrums of the mid-Atlantic. Mid uh, but the population of Washington, D.C. woke up early that morning, and they stuffed themselves into wool suits, and the women into petticoats, and they got their carriages ready. In the darkness, they set off away from Washington, D.C. And what's really kind of interesting about this very venue here today is they set off 25 miles from where we stand today, almost exactly 25 miles due west of this very site. And they did that. There were politicians. Uh, there were professors. There was, you know, kind of all the important people, the merchants of town with their children in their wagons. You know, they had gone through everything. They, uh, they had their sandwiches. They had their opera glasses. They had refreshments, right? They were all ready. They were in their finest clothes. They had, going 25 miles west here to this nice little river valley. And as uh, day broke that morning, a beautiful blue sky came out. It was going to be a fabulous day. And they started to settle themselves along the banks of this river. And they settled themselves on the hilltops and the knolls that surrounded it so that they have a, a tr tremendous you know, view of what was out there. The river was called Bull Run River. It's in Manassas Junction, uh, like I said, about 25 miles uh, due west of here. And Everything was calm and normal and serene, with the exception uh, that Irwin McDowell had 35,000 Green Union troops on one side of the river, and Pierre G. T. Beauregard had 20,000 Confederate troops on the other side of the river. Other than that, it was a, just a beautiful place to picnic that morning. Um, so with, with that in mind, uh, what had happened is that these people had all come out here. While they had sandwiches and opera glasses and all the things that they had remembered, what they forgot on their checklist was common sense. They had awoke that morning believing that history was going to be made, that there was going to be a quick and resounding defeat of the Confederate Army, uh, and that they needed to be there to kind of account for where they were that day uh, when this civil war that had really not been going on very long uh, would end. And the population uh, came out to that. And the battle uh, began late, almost as if neither side at that point even knew what to do, right? You know, like, well, do you start? Do I start? Well, no, you first. You know, they, they kind of jabbed back and forth. It was kind of a disaster. The troops were green. They didn't know what to do. The commanders were lazy and ill-trained. Uh, it was really a mess. And they kind of skirmished all day long to completely no avail. And then Joseph, uh, one of the uh, cavalry generals, had received a bunch of information from Confederate spies and brought an additional 11,000 Confederate troops. So now the battlefield was actually kind of even. There were about 35,000 troops on both sides. It waned into the afternoon hours and about four o'clock in the afternoon on July 21st, 19, 1861, the Confederates made a, a massive surge into the Union lines. And the Union lines were ill-trained, volunteers didn't know what to do. They were poorly, uh, kind of guided and led uh, by their officers, and the lines broke. And uh, you can see the lines break, and they started to scatter, and it really opened the gateway, being only 25 miles away from Washington, D.C., it opened the gateway for Confederate troops to walk directly into Washington, D.C. There was a crisis going on, but Irwin McDowell that morning stood his ground. At no point during this crisis where the lines had broken, at no point during the crisis did he show any sign of fear, loss of confidence, no tremble, no tremble in his voice. He just stood and watched. 
Curiously, right, as the troops began to scatter and the situation got to get worse, nothing changed at all in his disposition. And just when it looked like all was lost, he slowly reached into his breast pocket and he could feel what he knew was there, what he knew would save him. It felt cool to the touch. It was smooth. He pulled it out and it bore a light as if it had its own soul. He pulled out this tool, and with one swipe of his finger, up came Google Maps. He could see all the troop locations and where they were, all all of the weaknesses in their line. And with another swipe, suddenly a drone army flew up into the sky and with cluster munitions began to drop them with precision everywhere on the battlefield, pushing the Confederate soldiers back, saving us from a civil war that cost 620,000 human lives, more than half of all U.S. casualties from all war combined from that day until today. And we restored tranquility to the Manassas Valley all in one day. We have documentary evidence of this. <laughs> I, I can see up here, even with the bright lights, that there is some doubt as to my authenticity, okay, of how I portrayed this moment. But we have, we have documentary evidence, and uh, Apple thinks that's great. They also believe they stopped this carnage, right? And it also answers a whole other question is why all great military leaders get their picture taken with their hand in their breast pocket. Okay, like that's a coincidence, right? Like everybody unbutton, come on, unbutton your shirt, put your hand in there and go, selfie? No, that is not why. We know now why because we all kept our cell phones in there in case we needed a little bit of help. So none of that really happened. Uh, But the question is why didn't that happen? And this this is the subject of why we're here today. What is the rate that technology can change? What governs the rate that you can grab technology, integrate it into your opportunity horizon, integrate it into your company, and use it to build the future? Obviously, during the Civil War, they couldn't use cluster munitions, and they couldn't use drones, and they, they didn't have any kind of satellite imagery that they could use in the battlefield. None of that existed. But what's really interesting is I do like to study it, and the reason I like to study it is because it was a period of profound technology change that occurred in four years. So this really short period of time, all kinds of things happened, for good and bad, but, but all kinds of things happened during this time. So let's take a look, first of all, in the armories of the Civil War. For either the North or the South, it didn't really matter. The weapons were all the same. So for for guns, they had two guns. They had an 1842 musket. So let me make sure we all understand what a musket is. A musket is just a a firearm that uses a charge and a ball, and there is no rifling in the barrel whatsoever. So you stuff this ball down in it. You fire this explosive. This ball basically rattles down the barrel, right? And depending exactly how it's rattling when it comes out the end, it kind of goes in that direction, which means its accuracy is just deplorably horrible, okay? Now, in 1861, right, right as the Civil War began, we began to rifle our muskets. We put a small spiral in the musket that would put a spin on the ball as it went out, stabilizing it aerodynamically, right, so that it was more accurate. So, but that was the limit to what we had in our arsenal at that time. Then they had a uh, 1958 Remington revolver, uh, and we had this beast over here. We had a 12-pound Napoleonic cannon. That, that was basically it. That's what we had in our arsenal at the, at the beginning of the war. If you went to our harbors, uh, they didn't look a whole lot more modern. I mean, this thing's like out of Jack Sparrow and Pirates of the Caribbean over here, right? We had great big, huge sailing ships with cannons on both sides. And then there were a few ships where we had these sailing ships and said, oh, wouldn't it be cool if we put some kind of coal boiler in the middle of it and it could kind of self-propel itself if there wasn't wind. But that was what the, the naval fleets looked like at the beginning of the war. So the question is, where could you go from there? How fast could you go from there? And what limited the ability to innovate and then integrate those innovations into your arsenals? So we begin uh, very simply with a rifled musket. Now, the rifled musket had an accuracy of about 50 yards. Um, It was lethal to 200, but let's talk about 50 yards here. 50 yards literally is like the width of this room. So at that point in time, what you would do, the old-fashioned way of fighting is you would line up very close proximity to each other, and you would kind of fire, and you would kind of hope that your projectiles would go in the general direction of your enemies. That was the state of the industry. Now, right before the Civil War, there was a French munitions officer by the name of Claude Manet. Claude Manet used a technology called 
uh, obturation. And obturation is simply the expansion and, and, and the closure of a vessel. So he designed this munition, munition that you see up here on the left, and you see the hollow cavity behind it? What this allowed you to do, it allowed you to create a, a projectile that was not the exact diameter of the barrel. So it would be very easy to put down the barrel, right? And when the charge went off, it would flare the projectile to seal it within the barrel, creating no variation as it traveled down the barrel. And because it was pointed, the spin that was induced by rifle made it extremely accurate. So it fundamentally kind of changed war. Now, what James Burton did at Harper's Ferry uh, Armory is, is he took that basic invention that had been known for a couple of years and he made it mass producible. He made it so that you could make millions of these things really quickly and you could distribute them tr to troops. So what that enabled us to do is we went from this, this warfare of kind of accuracy at 50 yards, accuracy at 50 yards, okay, to, to about six times the capability. We now had accuracy of about 300 yards and marksman capability to 500 yards, so suddenly the entire art of war changed. No longer were cavalry charges effective because you could hide behind trees, you could shoot for up to a half a mile lethally. It fundamentally changed warfare by borrowing these small technologies. Now, two years later, this fellow, Christopher Spencer, walked into Abraham Lincoln's office with a loaded weapon. Now, literally, he had a brand new invention called uh, the Spencer Carbine. Uh, he wanted to show it off to Lincoln. He was not announced, he had no appointment, he had a box of cartridges and a gun, and he walked right into the White House, directly into Abraham Lincoln's office and said, I have something to show you. An hour later, they went out on the mall, which is right down here, and Lincoln and Spencer started target shooting with this new weapon on the mall in front of the White House. So what he had done is he had basically combined now the ball and the charge. He had taken those two pieces, put them into a brass shell, and created a cartridge. And then he loaded six of these things into the stock of the gun. So literally, you could reload, right, almost instantaneously. What that did, it allowed you to shoot 20 rounds per minute. So you could shoot five to six times more often than you could with any of the predating rifles. You can imagine, again, how this fundamentally changed the battlefield and, and changed the war. <clears throat> now, what else did we learn? Well, we, we had the Gatling gun one year later, and the Gatling gun was kind of a six barrel device, hand cranked with six different barrels so that the barrels could cool in between firings. It could shoot 200 rounds per minute during the war. It was designed by a physician, which is kind of, you know, in a way, a coincidence or some kind of irony, at least. Um, he was selling guns to the Northern Army, but he was a member of the Order of American Knights, which is a saboteur organization that had Confederate sympathies. So, you know, it's all conflicted and around all this kind of stuff. Now, on the Confederate side, there, there is uh, the two brothers called the Rains Brothers, and they were called uh, the Rains Brothers, uh, kind of are the, the bomb brothers. They really invented warfare because until this point in time, there was no real use of bombs. Landmines, torpedoes, hand grenades, you know, uh, any of that kind of stuff. Uh, and the Rains brothers really capitalized on this. And over a series of years from 1961 all the way through the end of the war, all of the basic kind of landmines that we know of today were developed during the war during this very, very, very short period of time. Again, completely changing uh, the, the, quote, art of war. And you can see this, this kind of incremental nature of change in full display in the, in the marine archives. You know, we, we started uh, with Captain Jack Sparrow's, you know, pirate ship. Uh, we then added to it a steam engine. We then said, well, I guess we don't need sails. We can go full steam. And then we said, oh, there's torpedoes out there. We need to put some iron cladding on the outside of that so it doesn't blow up every single time we hit, you know, get close to something or a cannonball can bounce off of it. And then we decided we didn't need wood at all and we could build iron ships completely. And all of this took place in four years. In four years, we went from one end to the other to completely change the naval fleet and how we use these weapons. We also ended up introducing submarines and torpedoes. And I don't know, I, I think people were just more brave back then, perhaps, because you know, somebody comes up to you and says, hey, I'm going to build this iron vessel that leaks profusely. Uh, you're going to have to hand crank it yourself, but don't worry about breathing. We'll put a hose that will somehow float on the surface so that you can breathe. And by the way, if that's not a good, bad enough idea, we're going to strap a bomb to the front of it so that you can run into other ships. Okay. And you're going, that sounds like home building. Right? Yeah, it's kind of pretty much the same thing. Yep. Right? 
So anyway, yeah, that's, that was kind of the state of the art. And again, again you've got to look at the way these incremental innovations occur. So what happened once we had torpedoes and once we had submarines, then we had to create minesweepers and we had to protect our boats. And this was the first innovations that you saw was to put iron nets draped around the boat. So as it swept across these torpedoes or land sea mines or there were submarines, they would simply, the explosions would occur far enough away from the ship uh, so that they would be rendered innocuous. So, you know, what's the spark? What, what creates this innovation? What, what governs, you know, this speed? And, and the key to all of this is something called adjacency. Uh, and we're going to go through this pretty fast because John told me right before I got on stage that I don't have an hour. I have 35 minutes. Thank you, John. Thank you. Uh, so I had to cut a bunch of slides out, but we're still going to go through this. So adjacency and managing your adjacency is the key to basically embodying technology in your business and, and using it to build any kind of future. And the basic model for this is this kind of Vitruvius man. It's Leonardo da Vinci's Vitruvius man. If you kind of take man, you can think of yourself at any one point in time, is there's kind of a boundary around you. Everything inside of that is stuff we know, and everything outside of that stuff we haven't discovered yet. And we're going to explore how that really guides everything. Because you look today at the greatest inventions, whether, you know, you know, whether it's, you know, Sir Richard Branson or whether it's Elon Musk and Tesla or whether it was Airbnb or whether it's Steve Jobs and what they did. None of these people really had eureka moments. All of these were simply the ability to have polymath skills, to suck in as much knowledge as you could from everybody around you and to care and know a lot about the problem and apply the technologies that already existed to current situations. And there's probably no better example of that. When Steve Jobs visited Xerox Park in Silicon Valley and in one meeting he stole the mouse and the graphic user interface. It wasn't his idea. He had never even seen it before. What he understood is he understood the problem. He knew the problem well. He, he understood the frustration that people had using the devices. And when he saw technology, he gathered it and put it inside of his knowledge base so that he could solve problems better than anybody else. And by the way, if you go through that, that's the same with Tesla. What, what Elon Musk saw is he saw charge capacities of laptops getting so incredibly dense that you could actually power much bigger things, like a car. He didn't invent the batteries. Tesla doesn't even have real battery technology. It's Panasonic's battery technology. But what he saw is he, he pulled that into his universe so that he could build a business for the future. So graphically, what that looks like is this orange circle. The orange circle and everything inside of it is what we know as individuals or organizations. So this works either at your own personal level or it works at your organization level. This is the knowledge that we have to map out and guide the future. It's our, what we call our embodied knowledge, right? And, and the dark orange sphere around there is our opportunity horizon meaning that is the leading edge, the boundary of what we know stops and what we don't know starts. And what lies beyond that is all the knowledge and ideas and things that exist today, but we don't know about them. That's AI, that's data science, that's VR, that's AR, that's IoT, that's all of those things. And how other companies are using them, how other industries are using them to improve their business. That all lies out there in the yet-to-be-discovered piece. Now, farther out from that is stuff that has to be invented, and we're, that's not even the subject of this, so we're going to kind of move on. So this, this boundary, this adjacent possibility, is kind of like a shadow future. All of your, you individually and your organizations have this shadow future. It's what you can become if you simply can utilize everything that your organization or you know at this one and very time. So again, back to Vitruvian man, it is the totality of everything you know, the experiences you've had, your network, the rules, the data, the science, the evidence, right? And then your ability to harvest it and harness it. So it's your ability to recall it, make the connections, have the time, not, not apply your own biases to it. And it's the catalyst to make that come true. Because we have tons of knowledge that we can't recall. So knowledge that you can't recall, knowledge that you can't fuse together, right, is, is, is not useful in planning the future. Now, one of the problems that we have for that is the cognitive biases that we have as human beings. 
When we go out and search for information, remember the blue circle here is what we already know. There's all this adjacent possibility sitting out there. Instead of going out looking for all the possibilities that we could possibly harness so we could build a future and make a great organization or a better version of me, what we tend to do is we tend to go out there and look for things that already confirm the things that I believe. We search for information that confirms what we know, not information that debunks what we know. This bias means that we look at a very small percentage of the adjacent possibility, limiting our opportunity and the opportunity of the organization that we live in. So there's kind of this strange, beautiful truth about the adjacent possibility in that it is, as the, its boundaries go, you can explore them and each new combination opens up the possibility of another combination. So you can kind of think of it like a house that magically expands, right? You keep opening these doors. So you have to not only open the doors that are available to you, you have to actually make sure and you have to add new rooms to your expanded nature. So ideas come out of this intersection. Uh, it's an intersection of what you know and how well you understand the unmet need. Uh, unrewarded genius is almost proverbial, and the reason it's unrewarded is because you're genius, but you don't have any idea what the needs are that you can apply your genius to. So there are two halves of this equation. You have to study stuff well enough to really understand the problem, and that's what Steve Jobs did so well. He fundamentally understood what people wanted from a technology product. He then simply went out to there to the adjacent potential and said, I wonder if there's any technologies I could use to solve that problem. And it's the same thing that Airbnb did. It's the same thing that Uber did. None of them actually developed anything from scratch. They understood the need and they harnessed the knowledge from the environment around them to build the future. So this is a slow and incremental process of how we do it, and you can see how different people that have kind of transformed the worlds have done this, right? When Nick Woodman went out there, he's a surfer, and figured out that he couldn't take pictures of himself while he's surfing, he went and invented GoPro. There was nothing in GoPro that was invention. It was simply a combination of technologies that already existed, and he understood the need and combined those into a new product. We had the same idea with Ikea. That came about to him when he tried to put a, a, a table in his car and he couldn't fit it in his car, so he disassembled the table and it said, wow, I wonder if a lot of people have trouble getting their furniture home. I wonder if you could start a business that actually had furniture that was simply disassembled. You, know, you can take a look at uh, WhatsApp. That was all about his inability to call his dad affordably. At Gap, he couldn't find pants. You can go on and on in hundreds of examples of how, first of all, the most important piece is to love the problem. You have, to, you have to know what the problem is and you have to love the problem. Once you love the problem, then you have to make sure that you have the embodied knowledge, either you personally or your organization, so that you can apply this technology to it. So let's look at some quick lessons from history. This is one of my most interesting ones, I think, that kind of cool. So the, the Fasig Timpton is a horse auction where they take you know, expensive racehorses up in Saratoga and they auction them off once a year. Their yearling sales happens every single year. Uh, in, in 2013, there were 153 horses at auction. There's an Egyptian beer magnet uh, that put his horse up for sale. Uh, it was known as horse D85. Um, what's, what's interesting about this story, though, is kind of the science of horse auctions. Um, th there wasn't much of a science to it. It's more like an art. So you, you get people that have, have grown up in horse countries. So, you know, the Kentucky horse country around Lexington, right? And they kind of know horses. In fact, you know, they all expression, look a gift horse in the mouth. They all look the horses in the mouth. They look at their teeth and go, oh, that horse isn't going to be any good. They would do all kinds of weird, you know, measurements. They would feel horses. They would look at how tall they were. They would look at what color they are. They would look at their spotting patterns patterns, and, and then they would go out and, and it would buy horses. It wasn't very effective, though. If you looked at the data, one in 200 horses that was bought at auction would ever win any kind of prize. Um, a third of them were too slow to ever win anything, a third of them would get injured, and a third of them would come down with Bartleby syndrome. And Bartleby syndrome is that the horse finally learns that he doesn't have to run. The horse kind of outsmarts the owner and says, I don't have to do this shit. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> What's gonna happen to me? Oh, you're gonna put me out to pasture. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right? <laughs> That's what I've been wanting to do the whole time, man. I'm gonna run slower and slower until that shit happens, right? So, so anyway, so, yeah. 
that's, that's the reality of it. In fact, you can see how bad this is. is there is a descendant of Northern Dancer and Secretariat, you know, both you know, very, very famous horses, sold for $16 million, total winnings $10,000. So this is just a horrible science, right? So, so this beer magnet hired this, uh, this team, uh, including Jeff Sater of e e EQB, and, and these guys were not horse people, okay? Uh, he lived in Philadelphia. He didn't live in Kentucky or Florida. He went to Harvard, okay? This is not horse people here whatsoever. He worked at Citibank for a while as an analyst, sports medicine, right? What he did, right, is he was constantly trying to expand his adjacent possibility. He was smart, analytical, curious, multidisciplined, networked, right? He just kept growing his knowledge base, right? From all of these different experiences. And he was hired by this owner of this horse, and he went out and measured everything. I mean, he, he, because he didn't have this pedigree, he wanted to manage with data. So he gave horses EKGs. He would actually go do autopsies on dead horses, right, to figure out what he could see there. He would analyze the poop of horses to see if there was anything in the poop, right? And then all of a sudden, he, he got a hold of ultrasound technology, and he, and he really latched onto something. What he found is that he could plot the size of the heart of the left ventricle was the single largest predictor in the success of a horse, uh, and small spleens was the single largest predictor of failure of a racehorse. Uh, after he did all that, at auction in 2013, he went back to the owner of D85, and he said, look, I've gone and I've screened all of the horses here, and the horse that you're selling is the best horse that's here. You gotta buy him back. Okay, you never buy back your own horse at auction. Once you put it up for auction, you have to auction them. So what he did is uh, he then created a pseudo name of Encarto Bloodstock. He went back into auction and he ended up buying his own horse back for $300,000, which put him in the bottom quartile of all horses at auction. Uh, three months later, they renamed it American Pharaoh. 18 months later, on a 75 degree day, American Pharaoh became the first horse in 30 years to win the Triple Crown. Adjacent potential. Right? This is the ability of taking science, data, ultrasound machines, statistics, and gluing it to the horse racing industry to create something that hadn't ever existed before. This happened with the Oakland A's, right? With Billy Ball, and I can't go through all this, but you know the story of Billy Ball, right? Yeah, they didn't have any money, they had horrible losing records, they hire the statistician wonky guy, he comes in, he finds all these players, he puts it all together, you got the team. What he does in there is he confronts kind of their senior kind of scout. And their senior scout has had it. He's had it with statistics, he's had it with all this stuff, you know, and he sits there and he goes, look, I've had it, this is ridiculous, you can throw a Google boy, you know, out because the whole world's gonna laugh at you, blah, 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 blah. And uh, then Brad Pitt at the very end says, adapt or die. And it is that lesson about change. Change in the organization, how hard the organization, how hard those that have not embodied this new knowledge into their knowledge base, how hard it is to get them to embrace this new potential that you have discovered. How many times, right, could you, in this case, he uses the word baseball, right, but how many times have we run into saying, where that's not how it's done in purchasing, that's not how it's done in architecture, that's not how it's done in marketing. What they're saying is, my sphere is really small. And your sphere is a lot larger than mine, and I'm unfamiliar with all those things that you're talking about, and I'm scared of them. So the biggest issue we have as companies, as organizations, as departments, is the inclusiveness. As each of us grow, how do we learn to share and network so that we grow together so that we end up not having the problem of change and change management? Because the immune white blood cells of an organization will successfully attack and kill every new good idea. That is a much harder problem to solve than the acquisition of knowledge to build the future. So, what can we do to improve and manage this adjacent possibility? Remember two things. First of all, we want to expand our inventory of knowledge and experience at an individual level and as a corporate level or a departmental level. And we want to understand the unmet needs better and better, in fact, better than everybody else uh, in the market. So we know we want to do that. So how do we do that? We need to expand what we know, improve access to the knowledge, expand our networks, and activate the network. So first of all, what can we do to expand our cognitive inventory? Pretty simple, we can attend conferences and webinars. Congratulations, you're all here, you've already checked off box number one, you can say I did that this year. 
But the issue is, what do we do here? You know, are you sitting next to somebody you don't know, or are you sitting next to people that you're comfortable and familiar with? Hmm, that's good. Have you talked to strangers? Hmm, I know, your mom said don't talk to strangers. Talk to strangers, right? Um, block the digital filter. Browse and create serendipity. Go into information sources that you normally don't get information from and seek it out. Take up hobbies. Uh, gather an eclectic circle of acquaintances. Experiment. Collect and analyze data. Have peer review of your ideas, but review your ideas with people that you normally wouldn't review. I always suggest to people, find the person in the company that irritates you the most. I know for some of you go, oh, I got a whole list, right? Okay, <laughs> you have lots of people to do peer reviews. Find that person and the next time you have an idea or a project, ask the person that irritates you the most to actually review your project. You see, we don't do that. We have this cognitive bias that what I do is I assemble all my friends that think like me and I want you to review my idea because I don't want the conflict. But that doesn't help us grow. It doesn't help the organization grow and it doesn't vet the ideas because I would bet that part of the reason that you're uncomfortable with other people is you both have different embodied knowledge bases. And they, you see things from different perspectives. If you can harness that, Bring that together, then you can create the power of two. And then, you know, lean in, cultivate a little FOMO, read whole articles, books, and varied topics in short order, or hire a gig worker. Go hire five interns for, you know, 12 bucks an hour that are still students and have them work on something inside of your company for you to see how they would approach things, just to get yourself out of your comfort box. Now, the next thing is we got to tap into all that knowledge, and, you know, we have this incredibly complex chemical computer up here that is far more complex than kind of anything that we can think of. There's a hundred billion neurons in our brain. Each one has a thousand connections. That's a hundred trillion connections in every single one of our brains. To give you an idea, there's only 1.8 billion web pages, uh, websites and only 4.7 billion web pages out there. So our, our brains individually are vastly more complex than the entire internet combined. So we have all this knowledge, all these lectures, all the things we've read, all of our experiences, they're all there. The problem is, is we don't have recall to it. And, and if you don't believe me, I'll just ask you to do the simplest thing that says in chronological order, just tell me what you did from the age of five. That's not how our brain thinks. You have all the knowledge, I guarantee you it's there. But you can't actually sit there and go, oh, at five, July 21st, when I was five year old, I did this, and then on the 22nd, I did, and then on the 8th, I did, and then blah, 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 and yellow school bus came at seven o'clock the next morning. All of that is there. You just don't have access to it. So how do we gain access? Well, the brain's kind of a complicated thing. First of all, you know, the right-hand side of the brain actually does not sleep. The left-hand side of the brain sleeps. The right-hand side does not sleep. It has no language skills, so it does not speak or communicate in a way that we can think. And it makes connections via patterns, and it operates in two completely different modes in both chaotic and synchronous communication all at the same time. So it, it's incredibly complex, but there are things that we can do to enhance our cognitive recall. We can write things down. How many of you actually still write things down into some kind of log or book and you can pull up, open a book, and you can go back a year and say, I was at XYZ and here's what I knew. Now, best practice, every year, get out the last three years of your books and go through them again. Spend a day looking at all the things that you learned and you did and you thought about. This is the same thing that Darwin did and all great scientists have done is write everything down. So you can start with that. You can take a hot bath. Why do you take a hot bath? Because a hot bath relaxes you and you, when you relax, it allows you to tap into the right-hand side of the brain and the brain begins to make connections randomly to help you find uh, answers. Archimedes used to take a hot bath. You can take a long walk because it stimulates alpha rays. You can engage in right brain activities and exercises. Uh, you can sleep <laughs> because many things have been discovered in sleep because what happens is the right brain keeps going and as you're sleeping, it is sitting there looking at all those things that you have in inventory and many times then it will make the connections. In fact, the whole structure of benzene was come to in a dream from a scientist that had been working for 10 years on figuring out the structure of benzene. And he woke up one morning and said, yep, that's it, because he had dreamed about it. He already had all the embodied knowledge. He just couldn't consciously tap into that knowledge. Keep a notepad by your bed and a pen so that if you wake up in the middle of the night and you think of something, write it down so that you don't forget it. 
Meditate, it develops frontal cortex development, right? Take a driving trip for alpha wave development or change your environment, you know, go do something different, get away from the desk. All of these things work. So I'm gonna end this simply with this challenge. You know, you're here for a reason. Now, some of you may have come here because you said, well, I heard there was free drinks, food, and transportation at a really nice hotel, that's why I'm here. Okay, congratulations, right? You got the easiest job. For the rest of you, you came here for a mission. You, you truly believe that technology is important to you and it's important to your business. And you wanted to get something out of this. So I'm gonna ask you to actually change your behavior. For the balance of this conference, don't behave the way you have behaved. We're gonna go to break soon and there's gonna be a cornucopia of food and beverage and stuff out there, right? You know, I'm, I'm sure of that, right? To go do that. When you go out there, fi find at least five strangers that you don't know at all, walk up to them, introduce yourself, find out about them, and ask them a question like, what's the last book you read? What has your company done to harness technology? What's the latest technology that you've integrated? What's the most interesting thing that you have seen lately? What conference have you gone to? Ask them something that can add to your embedded knowledge. So seek out strangers, okay? We've got to try to do a couple of things here. We've got to build you and your organization's embodied knowledge. We've got to figure out how to activate at an organizational level all of the knowledge that already exists. And we've got to be able to have recall to that knowledge so that we can tap into it and use it in the future. If we do that, we'll build a better future. So good luck tonight. It was fun talking to you. I hope some of this will resonate and I'll be one of those strangers out there talking to you. Thank you very much.